Uh, we have an agenda. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are going to call the Neighborhood Development Committee to order. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Alderman Moore. Alderwoman Howard. Present. Alderwoman Hubbard. Present. Alderwoman Murphy. Present. Alderwoman Spencer. Present. Alderman Gunther. Alderman Oldenburg. Chairman Cohn. Present. Five present, you have a quorum. Okay, thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, and thank you, members of the committee, uh, for your attendance this morning. Um, Madam Clerk, I do know Alderman Gunther is running uh, tardy due to another meeting, and Alderman Oldenburg had a family emergency, but they should be here a little bit later. But if you can excuse them in the meanwhile, in case they don't show up, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so this morning is a follow-up to the conversation that we had last week with regard to uh, the incentive reform uh, that has been, or the discussion that's been underway uh, for the last uh, year or two now. Um, and Alderman Rohde actually uh, in the HUDS committee has been doing a lot of the work around this in partnership with SLDC and the HUDS committee. Um, but obviously since our committee, the Neighborhood Development Committee, uh, deals with tax abatements uh, for the city, uh, he and I have been working together to try and make sure that uh, you know, our two committees are on the same page in terms of uh, what we expect to see moving forward as a policy for the city. Um, and so with that, Alderman Rohde is actually here this morning uh, to uh, share his perspective on the, the resolution that we discussed last week. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I apologize for not having been here last Tuesday, but I had an out-of-town uh, obligation that I was at, and I felt it was more important to um, um, get information to you as early as possible in the process so that we, uh, we have a number of bills in the uh, uh, HUDS committee that we've been kind of trying to hold up as somewhat of an artificial uh, creating a sense of urgency on this resolution because these things have a way of uh, going on and on and on unless you uh, create somewhat of a deadline. The uh, uh, by way of background I became after I became chairman of HUDS I uh, spent a fair amount of time doing some analysis on my own and we um, presented to the HUDS committee what I thought was the uh, a basis for uh, an argument to develop a, a citywide economic development plan. As part of that, we felt that we needed to understand incentives better. So uh, we uh, contracted out with a group that did an incentive study. I think most people on the committee are probably aware of that. And in uh, about that time, we hired our first financial analyst uh, in the area, and that's uh, Jonathan Ferry, who uh, began developing a model to determine whether or not the incentives we were using were actually being profitable. Um, there was a number of problems with our previous way of doing things. We, uh, we didn't take into account, as an example, um, what's called the substitution effect. In other words, you build something new, a new retailer, and it will actually take sales away from the previous one. And so um, we began uh, developing a model, kind of beta testing that for most of the last year or so. And then at that time, it was uh, uh, becoming increasingly clear that there's a lot of expectations from the community that we do something in that effect. So we began uh, the concept of uh, until we get the resources necessary to develop a, you know, economic development plan on the interim, we need some sort of uh, basis of agreement. So the idea was we were getting bills coming in down here, and, uh, you know, there's 28 of us. All of us have a different perspective on what should or shouldn't be incentivized, and um, you end up with a whole bunch of different ideas about what projects are appropriate or inappropriate. And that creates a lot of uh, angst among a developer who might work for a year or two on a project, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, then bringing it down here and then realizing that he, what he thought was going to be available from the city in the form of economic incentives may not be available. And then we have this kind of, uh, kind of bloodletting amongst all of us. So the idea was is if we could create some sort of um, you know, guidelines that we all kind of agreed to, perhaps we could go, uh, avoid that um, uh, consternation uh, among developers. We develop a, a clearer path to, you know, what is available and isn't available. And so with that, we, uh, we began having hearings um, uh, early this year. We had a number of hearings uh, based on a, a 
template, an initial resolution that was prepared by SLDC. We got feedback from that. We provided that to them. They've been revamping it. And what slowed us down, uh, and throughout this time, I've been talking to your chairman with the idea that we wanted to make sure that this had broad support among the board, otherwise it would be meaningless. Um, what has slowed us down was, um, I, I think there is general agreement on the HUDS committee, but there was, uh, I guess, uh, the major concern was the, the specific specificity or the succinctness of, you know, you know, the actual guidelines. In other words, there, there might be too much wiggle room in them, which if there's too much wiggle room or too much in definition, uh, not enough definition, what we end up having is, you know, we're back to where we were. So we were kind of struggling with that. At one point, we were taking a look and thinking about tying it to the market value analysis. When we had the public hearings, there was some criticism of that, that it wasn't being updated enough. Um, and then something uh, you know, else that kind of came out is, is that different projects are eventually going to have different profiles. By that, let me explain. You know, if you go ahead and do a residential project, you know, our motivation for doing a residential pro project is different than our motivation for doing a retailing project. A retailing project actually has the opportunity to make far more money for the city than residential. Likewise, a commercial development that may bring jobs has a far different, you know, reason for subsidizing that. Um, there's a, a good paper by Hank Weber, who's, you know, out at Warshu, and um, who's the uh, professor out at UMSL. Uh, they've done a, a comparison of a variety of different neighborhoods, and one of the things that they identified as stabilizing neighborhoods is close by employment. And um, so when we incentivize jobs, what you'll find is, is that a lot of people working in those jobs might very well live in the neighborhoods around them. So we began taking a look at, uh, at perhaps segmenting how we divide the how we d design the incentives. And so with that then, um, we, we came up with a couple different categories and then the idea of how to tie that so that the incentives are actually um, starting to, to be geared to greater incentives into the more challenged neighborhoods and lesser incentives in neighborhoods that have stronger market value. But at the same time, recognizing that when we do a new project, we want to make sure that we make more money on that project than what was there before. So we actually have a net new increase. So uh, Jonathan Ferry uh, was kind of charged with that as kind of a, I wouldn't say a last minute switch, but it's been, uh, he's been kind of hustling. And again, that was the idea is, is that the market value analysis was more geared for just residential and it was somewhat dated. So the idea, uh, so his hope is, our hope with this is that we would actually approach different types of projects differently as, as we develop a business plan for this or an economic development plan for the city. We expect that you know, we will understand and learn more as time goes along. I, I think everyone knows that we've hired a recent financial analyst for the board. He's a very capable man with a, a lot of experience in this area. And um, so that's kind of where we are. And um, I haven't actually seen this presentation, so I'm interested to in see it myself. So this is what Jonathan's been working on for the last couple months anyway. Okay, thank you. Um, so, <clears throat> thank you, Alderman Rohde. Um The main purpose of us uh, meeting this morning was actually at last week's meeting. A lot of us had uh, questions, comments, concerns around the models that were being used uh, or the quantitative approach to evaluating municipal return on investment uh, um, that Mr. Ferry was talking about last week. And so I invited him back this week to elaborate further on how the model was created and what it does. Uh, so without further ado, you know, Mr. Ferry, if you'd like to uh, start your presentation, that would be wonderful. And also, is there a hard copy of the presentation available for folks? I mean, I can get it to you. It was emailed out, but um, I didn't bring printed copies. Okay. All right. Email's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was emailed last week at some point, middle of last week, Thursday maybe. Okay. Do you mind sending it again? Yeah, I don't remember seeing that. Although it, maybe it was too large. 
Hmm. I've got it in my email. I'll just forward it to Alderman Rohde real quick. Morris to you, okay. I think he's emailing it to you, Terrence. Yeah, thank you. While we have a short commercial break, Alderwoman Murphy is going to sing a little ditty for us. That would clear the room. I heard your okay. An Irish lullaby, or Happy I've Jonah got too. a lovely bunch of coconuts. Diddly D. <laughs> no. Okay. All right. So, um, first of all, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and members of the committee for the opportunity to come and talk to you about the model that we've uh, we've developed. Um, so the reason I'm going to start with the uh, let me explain my be very casual here, but um, I'm going to start with this presentation because it kind of I think lays out sort of at the 10,000 foot view what is going on with the model, and um, and also because when we get to the actual spreadsheet, unfortunately, it's going to be. There's really no setup in this room where it's easy to see very clearly. Um, so it's going to be important to have sort of like the broad overview to understand how it works. Um, <clears throat> the model was included in the email that was, I believe, sent to you, Alderman Cohn, um, originally by Gerard. Um, I don't know if it was forwarded or not. But um, anyway, so I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. So, um, so this presentation is talking about return on investment. That's really uh, ultimately what uh, the scorecard comes down to. Uh, there's really two things that we look at. Um, this presentation is going to focus on the return on investment, but the other thing that we look at is um, testing the but-for case of the project. So essentially saying, but for this incentive, could this project happen? And that's looking more at the rate of return. We'll get into that when I look at an actual project example. But I want to talk to you about the um, how we look at the cost benefit to the city. So when we're talking about return, we're talking about tax revenues. Um, this is strictly financial return. We're not looking at um, we're not looking at any sort of um, intangible sort of uh, non-monetary benefits to the city. Um, we're also not looking at uh, what's called the economic impact. That would be such as, um, for example, if you were to say we brought in a new um, football team or whatever, soccer team, and they were going to bring in all kinds of additional hotel you know, stays and additional people are going to be shopping at restaurants around the stadium or whatever. We don't include that either. We just look at the direct revenue spent at the subject location where the incentive is being applied. So, um, so again, we're talking about tax revenue, so it's, you know, what you would expect. Property sales, income and payroll tax primarily. Uh, parking, food and beverage is also included. And then we need to look at the substitution effect. So I'm not going to hit on the substitution effect a lot in this portion of the conversation, but, um, but essentially that's just another word for that is cannibalization. So it's, it's the revenue that the city would otherwise get even if the project didn't happen. Um, Best example of that is, even though we don't have Walmart, but the you know, perennial example is you bring Walmart in and they steal a bunch of business from your small businesses, right? Well, the sales that you're losing from those small businesses are not new to the city, so it's not new tax revenue. So you don't count it, essentially. It's substituted out. This is an example. Very, It's not a real example. It's just numbers. But, um, but this just shows you like what can happen, especially with retail, which can have substantial substitution effects on them. Um, if you were to look at a project and give it a 50% sales tax TIF, so the TIF captures 50% of the economic activity taxes. If you took the same project, makes $2 million in uh, tax receipts, and you give half of it back, um, if there's no substitution effect, it looks like you're making a $1 million a year. If you have a 55% substitution effect, which is not unrealistic in retail, you could end up actually having a net loss of $100,000 a year in sales tax revenue to the city. Um, as far as how we get the substitution effect, by the way, I, that's we look at uh, market data. 
um, because uh, a lot of the projects, well, because there's uh, a lot of projects, uh, I really do sort of like high level um, sort of citywide analysis and use that as sort of a, a baseline. And then if there's, uh, if there's some sort of reason to believe that a project doesn't fit within the normal average what you would expect for the city, then we might, we might alter it. But generally we have um, set substitution effects that we use for, for types. So like for restaurant sales, you know, we use one rate for retail. Retail is the one that really changes project by project. Restaurant sales is pretty, uh, pretty monolithic in a lot of ways. Um, so, what? Well, and considering we usually don't uh, give incentives for fast food, so you don't, you're really only talking about mostly sit down restaurant. So, um, so that's very briefly what sort of is the, the return. But um, when you're trying to figure out whether it makes sense for the city to give an incentive, you really need to know what your investment is. So, very simply, your investment, I break down into two kinds of costs. The city has variable costs and fixed costs. Variable costs are simply the, the costs that the city would not incur if the project didn't happen. So that includes the incentive amount, and it includes any new uh, infrastructure or city services that would be required by that project. So for example, uh, although this doesn't happen very often in the city, if you had to build a new road to get to the project site or whatever, and the city had to maintain that road, you'd have to include that as your ongoing annual annual cost. Um, similarly, if you needed to hire, I don't know, two new police officers or something, um, you'd have to include that as well. Your fixed cost is, um, are the things that the city's going to pay with or without the project. So that's your um, existing infrastructure maintenance and existing city services, among other things. Um, I really hone in on the existing infrastructure maintenance, as you will see in a second. So why include the fixed cost? Um, the reason is the opportunity cost of land. There's just a, there's a finite amount of land in the city, although if you look at SLDC's um, list of properties that we own, you wouldn't think that's the case. But there's a finite amount of land in the city from which we can build our and generate our economic activity. Um, so effective land utilization is key to economic, economic and financial sustainability for the city. That is sort of the underlying premise that we're working off of in the models. Um, if you don't include fixed costs, it's very easy for us to understate the value of our investment in a project and then therefore give more incentive than what we otherwise should. So how do you allocate a fixed cost to a property? There's a couple different ways to do it. Um, but I, again, I use a, what I call an opportunity cost model uh, or framework. Um, Another example would be to just take all the costs in the city and divide it equally among all property, you know, on a per acre basis. Um, instead, opportunity cost model, what it does is it looks at, um, and I think we've got an example, maybe, in the, yeah, this example on the next slide, but um, what it's going to do is it's going to look at what is the economic potential for an area, uh, and it's going to apply um, the cost to an area based on what its potential to pay those costs are. So this is an example using downtown. Um, in particular, the commercial high-rise district in downtown. Um, so these are not exact numbers or anything. Um, they're just rough approximations. But um, my estimates show that roughly $75 million a year comes from the commercial high-rise district downtown. Um, that's out of a, an approximate city general fund budget of $500 million. So therefore, that area generates 15% of all uh, revenue in to the city. The uh, citywide annual budgetary need, I estimate, is at $600 million for the general fund, which I'll get to that in a second, how we get to that. But um, uh, that would be, if you take 15% of city revenues, which is what it currently generates, and multiply it by the budgetary need, you get $90 million, which needs to come from that district. There's, again, I just kind of made up this number for the point of the example, but 250 acres in that district would mean that you need $360,000 per acre that the city needs to generate annually in order to be financially sustainable. Um, so how do we define the districts? This kind of gets at um, what Alderman Rohde was talking about, but ultimately we look at um, building form and typology, um, uh, or building, I should say, form and use, really. Um, so example, use, you're talking industrial, office, residential, 
retail form you're talking about. Um, is it a high-rise building? Is it a single story? Um, that's sort of an indication of, uh, of what the market value of the land is, based, basically what people are able to support there economically uh, and build there. But, um, but that obviously isn't the, the only thing we do. But we start sort of with looking at what the building typology is, because obviously the more density you have on a piece of land, the more revenue the city's going to generate per acre. Uh, so, you, know, you know, the high rise is going to generate more than the single, single story you know, strip retail or something. Um, so I've got examples of the typologies there. Um, this is just how to determine the revenue in the district. I look at the, you know, I talk to the budget office, um, the assessor's office. We work with the State Department of Revenue for the sales tax and income tax data. Uh, and then we've got a lot of data from the Census Bureau and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So um, I talked briefly about the budget versus budgetary need and what the difference is. And basically, it's infrastructure maintenance, spending shortfalls, pension shortfalls, and, and uh, other shortfalls, you know, which we talked to the budget director to figure out what those are. So this is actual data from the city. I uh, worked with the street department to put it together. But um, if you can't, that's kind of hard to read, I guess. But uh, on the left, you've got a list of categories of infrastructure categories. These are things that the city maintains. So you've got roads, alleys, sidewalks, and so on. Um, you've got the amount. So in this case, for the roads and the alleys and the sidewalks, that is um, square feet. So that's the square feet of roads that the city maintains. Um, and then you've got the cost per square foot, um, that, uh, that what it costs to maintain that uh, maintain a, a roadway, for example. And then the replacement rate is how many times within a 25-year period do you have to basically invest that amount into that particular type of infrastructure. So in a 25-year period, generally, you have to, um, you're going to have to resurface your roadways about once every 12, 12 and a half years. So about roughly twice. So that gives you the total cost, what you would spend over a generation of infrastructure, 25 years for each category item. Um, for 25 years, the city would need to spend about $2.2 .2 billion maintaining our roads. That's an annual need of $89 million. <clears throat> so then, um, you know, then you compare that to what the city's actually spending on infrastructure and kind of get an idea. But, um, but we also use a general rule of thumb, which essentially says that 10% of a city's revenue and no more than 10% should be uh, going towards infrastructure in order for a city to be financially viable. That comes from uh, strong towns and a couple of enge civil engineering uh, groups, but, um, but we use that to estimate what the city's budget should be. Um, and then, uh, so you know, we get a, I think the city budget, you know, estimate, you know, we estimate, like, like I said on that last example, 600 million or whatever is what we would need for the general fund. I think if you include the other funds, it's something like, um, um, I don't know, it's like it's about $150 million ad additional per year is what we would need based on my estimates. So this is an example using Ballpark Village 2 uh, at what we look at. So in this case, the property size is 2.75 acres. The uh, annual fixed cost per acre that the model estimates for that part of town is $300,000. So that's an annual fixed cost of $825,000 per acre or for the total site. Uh, that the city needs to generate. The, uh, the new tax revenue that the project was um, uh, anticipated to generate after subtracting off the substitution effect was $1.8 million, and the incentive amount was $1.4 million. We assumed uh, annual growth rate of 2%, so about inflation rate, and um, it was a 23-year TIF term. Um, then we get to the 30-year rate of return. So the uh, over 30 years, that investment, that fixed cost, what the city needs to generate is $38.1 million. The revenue would be $75.9 million, but the incentive would be $28.8 almost. That leaves net revenue of $47.1 million, almost $47.2, um, which compared to that $38.1 is a 23.7% return on investment to the city. Um, so the calculation there is net revenue divided by investment minus one. So therefore, if it's greater than zero, it means we're covering our costs. Um, so in this case, the project was financially viable, um, and I believe it got a 
like a three and a half or something on the uh, the scorecard, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, I don't know how much I want to get into this, but basically there's, I think I'm going to skip this for right now, um, but this basically talks about how we, how we treat uh, districts that are sort of underperforming differently. Um, and that's basically going to be your areas that are struggling economically. Essentially, long story short, is um, we've built into the model a couple of ways to, uh, um, I guess, benefit those areas when it comes to uh, how we how we evaluate them and provide for more incentive. Um, in fact, I think the last slide probably. Uh, well, I mean that's an area that's of particular interest to me. Okay. As well. So I'd rather, and I think a few members of the committee as well would be interested in. You okay, know, I can go through it then. Because otherwise, I mean, it seems as though we're just valuing high density central corridor projects for incentives, which I don't think is the intent of. Yeah. The right. So, <laughs> so actually, yeah. So actually, I want to take a step back here. So if you look at this example, right, the idea. Um, of the example, and I, I want to actually clarify something I said last week, because as I was thinking about it, I realized I disagreed with what I, what I said. Um, so the, the, the way that the model is set up is not to um, steer things or actually promote the central corridor. It's actually to say that the central corridor has to have the highest standards. And if you don't meet the standards of the central corridor, you just don't get any incentive at all. Whereas if you were to take two similar projects and put one in the central corridor um, and you put one pretty much anywhere else in the city, South City, North City, what have you, um, what, the, um, what the model is going to do is it's going to say that in, in North City that, that project is going to get way more incentive than it's going to get in the central corridor. In fact, the central corridor it may get no incentive. In fact, most projects that would get the maximum amount of incentive in the north will get no incentives in the central. That's what, how it's set up. Um, so the idea, that what I was trying to say is not that the central is in any way sort of like um, more important, like it, if the city is going to reach financial viability, the only way it's going to happen is if the, is if the property in the city is performing to the level that it's capable of performing at, right? I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And so, um, if we make the mistake of allowing stuff into the central corridor that does not perform the way we, that basically the, it's capable of performing, in other words, if it's not highest and best use, we will not get to financial viability even if the rest of the city is developed. I guess that's kind of what I'm trying to get to. Unless, of course, the rest of the city starts to look like the central corridor, which I don't know if that's what we want. Um, does that make sense? Am I following? It's a 30-year return on investment, but on yeah. Return on investment, that's 23.7 over 30 years, not annually. Yeah, that's 23.7, right, that's the 23.7 return. So again, your, your net revenue is at 47 million and you're comparing it to 38 million. So you've got a return there of about $9 million over 30 years, above cost. So that's $9 million above what we're saying that piece of property needs to generate. Um, so the actual, if you were to look at, again, the actual cost that's incurred by the city by that piece of property, it's probably closer to like over 30 years, like $7 million or something roughly, right? Which means that really the city is bringing in $40 million more than what it's spending on that piece of property. Um, so when you're talking about actual costs, that is the cost that would be incurred if that property were owned by the city and left vacant. Essentially, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. What I'm saying is the model is attributing more cost to that piece of property than it would to another piece of property in a, a lower, um, an area that has lower economic value, mm -hmm. right? If we were looking at what the city was actually incurring, you would just take all cost and divide it. Well, that would be too simplistic, but basically you would look at like what the infrastructure is at the site and things like that. I mean, it gets kind of complicated, but... You know, I get the, I get your yeah. So, um, but again, what that also means is that because we're over, 
weighting areas like downtown, we're drastically underweighting other parts of the city, which means in parts of the city, we're actually willing to take incentive or give incentive and, and allow a project that actually generates less revenue than what the city's actual costs incurred are. But that's because we're trying to build that area up. Right. Yeah. So in other words, we're, we're subsidizing it not just with incentive, but we're subsidizing it with maintenance and that sort of stuff, budgetary expenses. So I'm, I'm going to make an executive decision here uh, because my understanding is that this presentation is going to take a little while to get through. So I think if we can allow Mr. Ferry the opportunity to go through the entire presentation and then, because I, I think each one of us is going to have questions on each of these slides potentially. So, um, well, I mean, I, I, my preference would be to go through the entire presentation and then as we have questions, write them on the, because now we have the printed copies in front of us. So if you have questions you know, for that particular slide, write it down on the presentation and then we can ask them following the presentation, if that's okay. Sure. What? Okay. <laughs> so please continue, Mr. Ferry. Yeah, no. I, uh. So, um, so that, so, Going back to the, the issue of underperforming districts, so um, so again, not all district types are gonna generate enough tax revenue to sort of sustain the infrastructure mm -hmm. built to support them like we were just talking about. So there's two reasons for that primarily. One is because the area is low density and the other is because the area is economically challenged or a combination of the two. So, um, so you could have low property values despite density and it might be because of high vacancy rates or, or something like that. So the strategy that we look at is um, we look at what the sort of the average citywide revenue per acre is by building type, and we compare that to the citywide average cost per acre. Um, if the building type in general is sustainable to the city, then it's something that is sort of eligible for incentives, even if in a particular area it's not generating enough because it's, you know, it's it just, you know, doesn't have the uh, doesn't have the sales tax base or whatever in the area to generate the sales revenue or, you know, it doesn't, it has a lower assessed value. Um, you know, the same building in two different parts of the city can be assessed differently because of market dynamics. Um, so anyway, uh, the, I guess the exceptions that we look at are, um, we uh, reserve incentive use for buildings that are historically significant structures. So that means if they're basically on the historic registry. Um, if they're a catalytic project in a struggling district or if they uh, provide significant non-financial community, community benefits. Um, and then, uh, I think that last sentence is redundant. Um, so I'm going to go through an example of uh, land use and costs and density. Um, I think, yeah. So we're going to do a, this, this is two actual pieces of property in the city. I don't think the big box retail actually got incentives, but I just assume that it did for the sake of the example. So um, this is uh, a mixed use project in the Central West End, and you've got a big box retailer, I think, on Kings Highway. Um, the big box retailer takes up 11 acres of land. The mixed use project is 1.2 acres. Uh, the property taxes per acre are about 525,000 to the mixed use, 14,000 to the big box. Uh, as far as the city goes, we collect less than 20% of that, so we got about 3,000 from the big box per acre and 111 uh, on the mixed-use project. And then the retail t uh, sales taxes per acre are about 104,000 to the big box and 169 to the mixed-use. Uh, there's zero residents versus 324 per acre and 14 jobs versus almost 59 jobs per acre as well. So when you look at this on a gross basis, you're gonna say you've got 11 acres times 100,000, you're saying, well, this project's gonna generate a million dollars a year, whereas the other project is you know, gonna generate um, you know, $700,000 a year or whatever. Um, so you think the big box retailer is probably the better project, but then you look at the, uh, um, yeah, what was that? Yeah, right. So you look at the, the cost per acre, which is that number at the very bottom, that almost $65,000. Now that's sort of like average cost. That's if you took all costs and divided it by the acreage, uh, taxable acreage anyway. 
which is about $65,000. So comparatively, you can already see that the mixed-use project is generating more than what it, that it costs to the city uh, than the big box does. But then if you were to give both projects the exact same type of incentive, basically in this case a TIF, this is what ends up happening. Um, you end up uh, ultimately with net revenue per acre from the big box retailer at $45,000 versus about 92 uh, from the mixed use project. When you apply the city's cost per acre, you've got a loss of almost $20,000 per acre to the city on the big box retailer and revenue of about 27000 for the mixed use project. So again, the mixed use project during the incentive period is, is still not necessarily generating a lot above and beyond um, what our costs are, but you gotta multiply that 20,000 by 11 acres, that's how much the city is losing a year. So almost $120,000 a year to incentivize that project. So that's kind of what the, what the model is based off. It's based off of sort of like this idea of smart growth um, concepts. The other thing that the model does is it looks at long-term versus short-term revenue. So, um, so it's a common scenario where, again, if you're looking at the cost that, this, that the city needs to get from a piece of property, that during the incentive period, the city is not getting um, up to that level, but after the incentive period, it's getting far beyond that level. Um, and I can, I'll, when we go through an actual example, I'll, I can talk about how, how we estimate the before and after or whatever. But um, in these cases, what we do is, A, you have to have a strong but-for test. That's essential to ensuring that the project truly could not happen without the incentive, because then you're really showing that, well, this piece of property is not gonna be generating any revenue anyway, so you're comparing some revenue to, to no revenue. Um, but then the this, this actual scoring methodology that you guys have seen with the, the star rating um, it's, a, it's a weighted scoring method that goes beyond just what the 30-year return on investment is, and it, it says how much, uh, like it, it weights points to how much revenue the city is getting relative to that target level uh, from day one, from during the incentive period, and then also it weights how much revenue the city is going to get relative to that target level uh, after the incentives are, are, are expired. Um, and then, so then that sort of creates that sort of line in the sand that tells us whether it's a go or no go. Um, so other things that we, you know, look at at SLDC, um, beyond just the 30 year return on investment, we look at the length of the tax incentive period. So again, if the, uh, if the project is only requesting a tax abatement of 10 years or less, um, the way that the score is weighted, um, we basically, the, so the number of points allocated to the sh immediate revenue versus the short, you know, long-term revenue, uh, it's a it's a smaller gap, um, meaning, uh, you know, we we treat them more evenly. If it's a long-term incentive period like a TIF, then the short-term immediate revenue is weighted uh, twice as high as the long-term revenue is. Does that make sense? Um, and again, we'll go through the through an actual example after the slideshow. Uh, but again, we look at the economic strength of the project's location. That's where the MVA, which is what we're currently using, uh, comes into the model. And then um, we look at uh, non-financial benefits uh, to the project as well. So those are things that don't get quantitatively uh, evaluated, but if a project is like right on the line, it, those are the things we'll look at to say, okay, well maybe we should and maybe there's something that the model isn't capturing. I think this is the last slide, yeah. So this is the last slide. So um, in general, what we do is, um, so we're looking at uh, a project in a healthy district and in a struggling district, uh, one during the incentive period and one after the incentive period. So again, looking at that variable cost, again, the cost that the city doesn't incur if the project doesn't happen anyway, um, during the incentive period, we expect that that project is going to cover 100% of its variable costs. So generally, there's not a lot of new variable costs for a lot of projects because, again, we're not usually building new roads um, or anything like that for, for projects because we're pretty well built out. But if we are, we expect that in both districts that the, 
the new revenue needs to at least cover those new costs um, uh, during the incentive period. Obviously, that doesn't really apply after the incentive period necessarily. But um, and then for the fixed costs in the in the healthy district, we expect that that project is going to generate at least enough revenue to cover the average cost per acre for the city. It may not cover sort of like that inflated amount. That, you know, if it's a really strong area and we say, well, you need to generate, you know, five times the city average cost, we don't necessarily say it has to meet that level during the incentive period, but it needs to meet the city's average cost per acre. Um, whereas if it's in a struggling district, which is essentially an area we wouldn't expect there to necessarily be a project anyway, um, we don't say it has to cover any of those costs because we're going to be paying them either way. We might, you know, even if we can get one extra dollar you know, towards paying those during the incentive period, we should, you know, we say we should do it. Um, and then after the incentive period, um, we expect the project to cover at least 100% of the, uh, the opportunity cost per acre. So again, that's that inflated number. So for downtown, that's the 300 or whatever thousand dollars per acre um, that, that the model estimates. And of course, it's, it's adjusted for inflation every year. So it would be whatever it would be at the time that the incentive expires. And same thing for the struggling district. That would be 100% of the cost breaker. So, I mean, I can tell you that, like, downtown, um, compared to, um, I don't know. Let's see, I've done projects in, I guess, like, I'm trying to think of numbers I've seen. But, like, Hyde Park, for example, I think I've seen projects there. On a per square foot basis, downtown, well, the core of downtown has to generate, I think, 11 or $12 in tax revenue per year per square foot of land area. Uh, whereas I think in Hyde Park, it's like 10 cents. So it gives you, a, you know, 10 cents per acre is what the model requires um, that project to generate in order for it to be considered viable um, to the city. So you can see how big of a difference the model is treating different types of the city. You know, so again, the only types of projects that are going to qualify for incentives in downtown are going to be really dense projects. They're going to be your high-rise and, you know, maybe tall mid-rise mixed-use projects. Whereas in other parts of the city, I mean, it's, it could, you know, it could uh, potentially approve a small, very low-density project. It could really ap approve almost anything uh, in a lot of ways. Which actually, that's the reason why there's other parts of the scorecard. Which unfortunately, the two people that were doing that part of the scorecard um, aren't available at SLDC right now. But uh, one of them left. Well, I guess they both left. But um, anyway, so but that gets into more like uh, urban design and things like that. So that's the presentation. Um, what I've got, and I know it's going to be hard to see, but what I've got in terms of the spreadsheets. Um, one is I've got the spreadsheet that actually how I calculate the revenue per square foot or revenue per acre, if you will, for every portion of the city. I can go through that if you want to understand that. And then I've also got an actual project example. We probably example. have enough questions from people just about the presentation right now. So okay. I think what we'll do is we'll take questions, you know, because before we get into the kind of logic model and how it works itself out, I think, you know, it'd be helpful to, you know, uh, let people air their questions. So uh, we'll just go ahead in order of seniority. Um, Alderwoman Howard. Um, <coughs> this is very informative. I, I want to compliment you on your attention to detail. Um, how is a healthy versus struggling district determined? I know, you know, the obvious is the central corridor downtown or considered, I guess, healthy. But then there's districts that, you know, could be marginal, and I, I don't know how is that by the present oh, moment we're using the MVA, um, the market value analysis tool that was created by um, the planning department, I think, four years ago. Okay. That's what we're using currently. And technically, even though that's only residential, um, we're using it even on commercial projects because we don't have an alternative. Um, but uh, that's what we're using currently. So what is the number for struggling versus? So there are, um, 
there's, it's not like one set number. There are nine different MVA categories, A through I, mm -hmm. and I think they look at at least, at least nine different variables. They look at things like um, the vacancy rate, they look at the average sale price of property, they look at the foreclosure rate, they look at um, poverty uh, statistics, so they look at a bunch of different things, and I do not, it's a HUD uh, Department of Housing uh, and Urban Development federal level um, model that's created, so I don't know the intricacies of how they do the breaking points. Is there a um, place where this is contained and we can look up our area? There is, if you go to Google and you type in St. Louis MVA map, the planning department actually has a tool where you can type in any address in the city and it'll tell you what the MVA is. Ah, thank you. Yep. Okay, that's all I have. Okay, the chairman stepped out, so I'll assume my role as a vice chairman here and continue to go down the line. Uh, Alderwoman Hubbard, you any questions? Thank you, Mr. <laughs> vice Chairman, well. for stepping in. Um, I actually just have a comment, not too many uh, questions. It, I found it funny when she mentioned the market value analysis. I mean, in my world, we have very few residential homes. I mean, it's all uh, low income housing. And I think um, that it's important for us, and it, it seems like we're on the right track here, but it's important for us to realize that while some people are anti incentive, I mean, like, the northern part of the city, we, we couldn't function. I mean, that's the reason it looks the way it does because incentives haven't been um, pushed that in that direction. So whereas I agree that we need some type of reform, I just think it's, uh, it's important for us to realize what, what we face in North St. Louis without any incentives. And it's a reason that you see the Central Corridor and other areas of the city looking the way that it does. And yes, they contribute a lot of taxes to the city, but I mean, a lot of projects have been pushed that way. And I just wish as a city, we um, try to move forward by, you know, offering some incentives to developers to develop North St. Louis. Because I mean, if I had my own personal money, it would be hard for me to just dump money into North St. Louis with its current conditions. So I think we all need to be mindful of that and moving forward with incentive reform, we need to realize that for so many years, for generations, we've pumped money into one part of the city while leaving the other part of the city just dead. So uh, we need to be mindful of that when moving forward with Can reform. Can respond? Sure. So, um, and I agree with you. And I think that, um, uh, you know, it, the way the model is supposed to work and the way that I, I believe it works the way it's supposed to, um, and I'm gonna take an example. Um, Let's say somebody wanted to build a four-family or, you know, f residential building. Um, right now, if you took that project and you put it in, let's say, the Central West End, the model is going to come back and it's going to maybe say maybe five years tax abatement, maybe no tax abatement, where you take that same project and you put it in, you know, maybe your ward, and it's probably going to say it can get the maximum amount that we can offer. Right, even if it's, I mean, I don't know if you guys would wanna give 25 years, but the model would probably say, if you wanna give 25 years, the model will justify giving 25 years. So the idea there is that then um, developers who wanna do four family flats are gonna know, well, I can't get much incentive if I go to the central corridor. If I want more incentive, I need to go somewhere else in the city. That's the idea of the model. So. Uh, Alderwoman Murphy. No questions at this time. Thank you. Alderwoman Spencer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Jonathan, for being here. Uh, I echo the, uh, you know, you, you did a nice job with all the details, and I appreciate it. Um, so when we're looking at, um, when we're looking at return on investment, one of the things I think was, one of the, uh, components I think was missing was sort of a uh, sense of a coordinated effort. One of the things that we, the way we kind of incentivize single family development right now is by parcel, right? We offer chapter 99s on single sites as opposed to kind of 
trying to create um, larger return on investment by coordinating and concentrating development you know, in a neighborhood or in a couple of blocks so that you're really kind of um, feeding off of each other. You're not just getting the return on that single investment, but you're um, capitalizing on including multiple incentives on one in one small concentrated area. You know, the north side to all the women um, Hubbard's point needs a lot of work, and so does my neighborhood. And if we sprinkle in a little bit of work here and there, it's really not going to get us anywhere. We have to start coming up with some planning to develop comprehe more comprehensive approaches to incentivizing development. I mean, we can incentivize one house on the 30, 4100 block of Oregon, and it's going to be a drop in the bucket. We need a concentrated, coordinated effort to be able to revitalize that block mm. um, in much the same way across some of our more challenged districts. Um, so I'm curious uh, your thoughts on how, um, you know, it, it, is the model looking at um, coordinating and capitalizing, building, feeding off of each other the different incentive packages we're offering? So first of all, I want to say I agree with what you said, um, that that's what we should be doing. Um, I would say that the model is, um, it, it kind of tries to do some of that, but it's very, I mean, it can only do so much, right? So the model is designed to sort of address somewhat of a slightly different problem, mm -hmm. and that was really trying to look at, um, does this make financial sense or not to the city? Um, now, what you're talking about is coordinated efforts that will have, you know, more of a synergistic effect. Um, and unfortunately right now, that's just not the way we have been operating for the most part. I mean, I think there's a, a push to, to go that direction, um, and I'm probably not the one to comment on it, but I, I believe like our neighborhood sure. business department is going to now be focusing their, uh, their resources on uh, target areas or focus corridors or whatever, whichever those corridors are, I'm not sure, um, well, and that type of thing. The, what I tried to do with this was I tried to base it off of, so the, the, uh, the land use plan is a big part and the MVA are the two big sort of like components that are sort of built into this. Um, it could be, the score could, scorecard could be adjusted um, to sort of, um, uh, give a an advantage of some some sort to an area that's in a planned area or in a targeted area. Mm -hmm. um, I mean that could easily be done. It's just right now we don't have a lot of those areas, so it's hard to. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, so the idea is, uh, you know, you to accommodate and account for coordinated approaches, which I think is gonna be the most effective way to try and um, drive development into some of our more challenged districts. You know, as I was pointing out when the chairman was out in the hallway, um, some of our more challenged blocks, if you, you know, if, if, if you take Dutchtown, for example, and just sprinkle in 10 single family uh, incentive packages, it's not gonna get us very far, but if you take the 4200 block of Oregon and 40, you, know, you try to do a concentrated area, you say, okay, let's come at this and let's drive development here, then all of a sudden um, providing an incentive package along those corridors not only starts to make sense but to the city, but starts to make sense to the developers too, because right now, uh, without a coordinated approach to some of this, it's very hard to convince developers to come in, even with an incentive package, and take on that risk. Um, so that's a frustration I have in some of the more challenged districts. Um, you mentioned the average cost of providing city services per parcel and per acre. Um, obviously, providing city services um, and the cost that the city bears changes dramatically. Um, district by district and I'm curious do you have that cost pr of pr you know providing city services downtown is significantly higher clearly um, you know p policing the streets the lighting infrastructure everything is done a little bit differently than it is say in um, more residential area and residential areas with higher density have bear a higher cost per parcel per acre because there's just more activity going on um, do we have do we have that sort of broken down by um, are we doing it by MVNA MVA um, district or 
because it doesn't, those don't actually follow the MVA necessarily. Um, there are other factors, density, you know, whether or not you have high rises and all that sort of thing, uh, public spaces, et cetera. Are, are we looking at the cost of providing city services in that way? So, um, so as far as like what the actual costs are for a given area, um, I mean, I don't have access to like police call data and that sort of thing to try and figure if that's what you mean. I don't mean that because that would significantly put our lower income areas at a disadvantage because there's more police calls. There could be more police calls per service, but I think rather in a sense of infrastructure, roads, lights, et cetera. Um, there's less use there. You know, our lights are just the copper headlamps. Not sure. The, right. You know, yeah, I mean, you know, the cost of providing um, infrastructure downtown is higher, right? I mean, you have more activity going on. Chairman, um, can I say something? Well, let, let I just, I'm just, I, I just want to, can I respond? Yeah, that's they have, with they have the SIDS and TIDS and there's right. offsets there that oh, supplement sure, for some, some of, that. of the no, no, no. higher demands. I, I guess areas. my question is just, are we looking at the cost of city infrastructure by district or are we just using a citywide average for that because I mean my, so, my um, estimation is that like neighborhoods have a lower cost of infrastructure um, well because they have narrower streets and things yeah so um, so in a matter of speaking yes so uh, for the actual analysis I don't actually use the average cost per acre I was just using that in my uh, presentation Sort of example purposes. Mm -hmm. um, in the actual analysis, the only cost per acre I use is that opportunity cost, and that's based on going back to that. Ex well, I don't have the PowerPoint pulled up again, but that's going back to taking how much revenue comes from a district, not how much cost comes from a district, but how much revenue. So the highest revenue areas have to perform at the highest levels. Um, and there's definitely a lot of correlation between um, areas that generate more revenue and have higher infrastructure costs, because generally the higher higher revenue generating areas have wider roads, have you know access to the interstates and things like that. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm looking at. I guess we don't have the numbers on the slides, but calculating the average citywide revenue per acre by building type and comparing that to the citywide average of cost per acre. There is. Um, there's a one slide in there that, um, I don't remember what slide number it was, but um, it's the one that is the uh, downtown high-rise district example. It's probably about a third of the way through the presentation, maybe. And, I, I mean, what I'm trying to get at is that when you, when you, when you um, create density, when you incentivize density, you know, to your point about the big box versus the mixed use, when you have density, you're generating more revenue per acre. And that happens in our more densely populated neighborhoods, and that's a good thing. And we want to, um, we, we want to drive that cost of, um, the cost per, of, we, it creates a better balance when you can generate more revenue in a smaller area. It creates more opportunity for us and and it, when you're incentivizing you want to incentivize in such a way that drives that and takes that into account so I, and if we're not taking if we're not looking at uh, average cost of providing city services by type of neighborhood that's that's okay I'm just asking if that's a, a, a part of what we're doing yeah again I it's it's more looking at what the revenue potential is as opposed to what the what the cost incurrence is from the area um, and I, like I said, I, not to re, you know repeat myself verbatim, but I really yeah, think that it's so, there's a high correlation between those two things. Then my last question is looking at catalytic projects in struggling districts. I mean, there there has to be some level of. Um, I mean, I guess I, I'm looking at how you know, these are very quantitative models. Sometimes you have to say, hey, this is going to be catalytic, and this is going to drive something that we can't necessarily quantify, but you know. You know, along the South Jefferson corridor, there may not be a lot going on right now. But boy, if we had a Trader Joe's, it would you know explode the area, right? So, and that may there may be some un, un, things you can't really enumerate. Um, and is there a room for some? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's qualitative. Um, this is the word I'm looking for. Analysis to be part of the yes, story. and I think that's um, that's part of the story that we tell whenever we present these projects to you guys. Um, you know, again, this the model is meant to be a tool to help you understand 
the financial aspect, right? And then, um, you know, ultimately the, the point of sort of creating this star rating or any sort of rating is so that you can compare a project and say, well, um, you know, you can compare them and then you can, you guys can in a way sort of like talk about them more objectively, but that doesn't mean that just because a project is like, like I said, if it's on the borderline or if it's maybe even slightly below what the financial, um, you know, model says, that doesn't mean that um, there's not necessarily a reason for you guys to approve it, but then that's up to you guys, right? Because some incentives may not work in very economically challenged areas, but they would provide a uh, civic good, and that's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. This is a very slow process, as I think everybody sees. It's almost like watching paint dry. Uh, this is probably the first thing is to get our arms around the kind of incremental incentives that we're offering. Mm -hmm. But there are other things that, you know, are some, you know, there are other incentive packages that are being added to projects on top of this that we don't necessarily always know about or are involved in the approval process. And let me give you an example. For example, uh, new market tar uh, tax credits are perhaps CDA block grant funding or section, mm -hmm. what do they call them, 108 loans, which we haven't done for a while. But those are things that are, that are on top of whatever mm -hmm. we're putting up on an incremental basis. And I think as we get our arms around this, the next thing would be to make sure that we're approach, approving those types of kind of on top, you know, those extras, uh, those extra layers are, are, sh are the things that we should be targeting to more of the transformative type of projects. In my mm -hmm. personal opinion, it's just that we haven't got, we got to digest this first and then I think we can start taking a look at that. Uh, the other thing, um, I was going to answer, we're looking at this st strictly from the city's perspective, and one of, uh, so the city has a much different cost structure than perhaps the public. By that I mean, the pub when I think of the public, I think of the, the school system. And w if you were to overlay residential versus commercial and the impact of the cost mm -hmm. of education, then you would see a h much different map and cost structure. So if we your previous question, if we went back to take a look at what the cost was by neighborhood, sure. then you would start seeing a, a, a far different look. So, yeah. And um, I, I really appreciate the work here. Uh, my questions weren't meant to be critical in any way, sure. but rather just getting out all the questions. I think um, I commend the work that we're doing here to try and um, overhaul the incentive structure and kind of drive um, in, in incentives in a, in a smarter manner moving forward. And, and so thank you for your work on this. Can I make a quick comment too? Sure. Um, so just going back to the idea of the sort of like targeted areas or, um, you know, priority areas or whatever, uh, I think there are some really good models around the country that we could look at. I think there are other things, other types of incentives besides just what we look at here um, that we should really be um, considering. I mean, we all already have revolving loan funds, for example, mm. but um, there are ways I think that we could... Um, I mean, I think a really good example, if you guys are not familiar with it, is something called 3CDC in Cincinnati. They, um, they redeveloped the Over the Rhine District, I think is what it's called, and the downtown area. And the way that they did it was essentially they concentrated on an area. They used their new market tax credit funds. They used the revolving loan fund. They used CDBG funds. They used all these sorts of things all in combination. And um, in doing so, they were able to provide gap financing that they were able to give loans at, um, you know, less than, you know, 80% debt coverage ratios and things that banks would not do. Those are, that, go, that goes way beyond what just a tax abatement does, because tax abatement essentially just increases your debt coverage ratio to a degree. And it's really not that big of a degree, honestly, in most projects. It's like a, it's, it's a small gap filler. Um, so... I think there are things we can do, but yeah, it takes a way more proactive approach, and I think it's it's just, you know, it's just something that we want to get to. I think that's the idea with the economic plan that we keep talking about, but, um, but I just want to say agree. That's all. Um, so a couple of different things. Uh, one, I did bring a copy of the MVA map, a very large map uh, from my office here, uh, and thanks to the ingenuity of our 
uh, of Terence. Uh, he has uh, managed to be able to rig that so that we can actually see it in the conference room here. Um, and then Alderman Ogilvie actually has to leave, so I'm going to allow him the opportunity to ask some questions. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my, my only question is about, I know there's been discussion about creating like a matrix so that on the front end, a developer or a builder who wants to do a project can kind of easily and quickly see, all right, what's kind of the maximum level of tax abatement or incentive I can expect based on you know, the address of this project. Right. And that is the additional value of just providing um, like a clear window into how the city vets these things just for the general public so they understand right. that we are doing we are doing fewer incentives or intended to do fewer incentives in healthier performing markets. So is that part of this presentation or? It's not part of this presentation um, per se. The, uh, we are, st I'm still working on that. Um, and at the last meeting, um, in fact, I see uh, Alderman Chairman Cohn has a copy of that map that I handed out uh, or maybe emailed out. But um, right now what I've got is essentially a map that sort of shows different districts, um, but uh, I am not to the point where I can say this is how much incentive can be capped for each district. I'm probably, if, um, sadly, a few months away from that. But, um, and I, I, it'd be my opinion that at this point, if, you know, since there's a lot of log jam going on, my opinion would be to look at the resolution and then maybe just attaching the map and saying that in general, more incentive is allocated to these areas of the map and less is allocated to those areas of the map, but exactly how much is coming later. And then we can attach that, you know, three to six months from now or whatever. But, but yes, I'm working on that and it's coming. Thanks. Okay, okay. Uh, Alderman Gunther. Thank you, Chairman, um, and thanks, John. Um, so I guess this kind of ties on to him. So my really only question was uh, <clears throat> some people have made mention about the MBA map, you know, almost being outdated already. So um, is this creation of the new map eventually going to kind of uh, phase out the MBA map, or do you have idea of a way to uh, continue to update that MBA map without going through the huge process of, you know, the the past study that was done in 2014, I believe. Um, is there a way to just kind of update that more regularly? Yeah, so um, I guess first I need to clarify so I don't make a uh, uh, planning department uh, upset. I'm not replacing the MVA map. Let's get that out. Because the MVA map does other things <coughs> way beyond than what this is looking at, right? Um, what I am doing is I'm trying to create something that, uh, uh, you know, basically a map structure that the incentive cards can look, you know, the scorecard, the uh, model can refer to other than the MVA districts. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'm just going to interject as well because I've I've heard this time and time again uh, that the MVA is outdated. You know, the MVA was completed three years ago, August of 2014. So three years in the grand scheme of things, especially when it comes to real estate development, mm -hmm. it's not a long time to see transformation at all. Right, I think and our zoning I mean, just code Just looking is at from... the map, you know, not much has significantly changed on that map. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, North St. Louis is still light yellow and orange. Southeast city is still, you know, pink and orange. The central corridor is still blue and purple. Not much has changed. You know, I, I can't think of any particular area on that map that has significantly changed enough where the city has to go through the exhaustive process. I mean, that took about two years to undergo mm -hmm. the MBA and, you know, tons of money. You know, so it's not like this is a thing that we can have updated every single year. Um, Frankly, I would be happy if we could do it every five to 10 years. Uh, but also bear in mind that this was something that's it's the first time that the city's ever undertaken a planning, you know, uh, design like this since we did a plan back in the 1940s. And so, um, you know, well, our land use plan is probably the closest thing that we've done since then. Um, but, you know, this is a tremendous undertaking in and of itself uh, by the planning department and CDA. 
Um, so I, I don't, I, I just, I have to caution everyone, this is not something that will be updated every year, probably ever, you know, um, but I think it's something that we can look at and have at least a baseline approach and every, you know, five to 10 years, you know, updated as data changes. Um, but even three years after, you know, is completed, there aren't significant changes to the MBA. So, you know, yes, it's three years old, but it hasn't really changed. So I, I just want to throw that out there because, you know, I've, I've heard that a lot in the last two weeks in particular. So uh, was that at Alderman Gunther, by the way? Okay. Um, Alderman Oldenburg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, John, good job to you and the team and, and SLDC and, and everyone who helped sort of create these parameters, I think, that will help make data-driven decisions in terms of our land use um, and, and hopefully dovetails and will craft with the economic development plan that I think um, is, is following or being worked on now. Um, I had a question. I know, um, so this is just the city's return. I'm on the ROI example slide. Um, you do, though, on an individual analysis, um, do you assign or try to assign a developer return or a real estate return mm -hmm. as also as part of your your analysis correct yeah yeah the um, and what I think just you what what um, baselines are you using when you do that um, let me pull up the example is there a way to where Terrence go? is it uh, Jonathan is it next to the microphone what's that the, uh, well this I don't I need to get to the Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, I need you to steer for me. Um, can you open up the ABC project example? I know this is going to be hard to see, but um, Terrence, if you go down to the tabs and scroll to the right, go to the, um, I think it's called IRR. Okay, so, so you're using an IRR when you, based on your developer assumptions? Correct. Okay. Yeah. IRR evaluation. Yep. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So what I've got is um, I've got data from the Real Estate Research Corporation, um, which says, and this is uh, metro-wide data, but it says that um, rates of return, it gives different types of projects. So I've got, if you can't read it, it says residential, retail, office, industrial, hotel, uh, parking, so like parking garages, and then other. And then um, I've got sort of the range of rates of return that, uh, that are expected within the market. So at the low end is, you know, you can see residential low end is 5.7. Mm -hmm. Generally under 5.7, deals aren't getting done. Um, and then uh, and it goes down the line. Uh, the higher the risk project, the higher the rate of return that's, that the market requires. So hotels are generally considered the highest risk type of project, at least of the ones that are listed here. And so they have the highest uh, rate of return required. That's 8% at the low end. Yep. Um, so, um, Sorry, so, did yeah, you say so 5.7 was the, was the low end in terms of rate of return? For residential. I would agree with that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, so anyway, so uh, what I do then is I, I calculate a weighted rate of return based on the percentage of the project. That's, so if it's a mixed-use project and it's 50% residential and 50% office or whatever, I'll take a 50% weighting of the residential IRR and a 50% weighting of the office IRR, come up with that number, and then I will compare that to what the project is actually projected to get over a 10-year period. Sure. Okay. Good. Yeah. So that's, that's what I do for the BUT4 test. That's not part of the score, like the, the star rating. That's right. not part of the star rating, but it is on that summary report. So again, those are the two things I look at. I look at the but four test, that's that. And then I look at the, basically the cost benefit analysis, that's the star rating. And that looks at the revenue versus the cost. And, and these are for projects of a million dollars or more. I mean, obviously I, we're not doing this for the nuts and bolts projects. Which makes sense, great. Yeah, we don't we don't have a uh, a model set up yet for like the single family residential. Eventually, I'm hopefully get there, but we're not there yet. Sure, and I think you know just going back to the first slide as well, um, what looks like how you're measuring return um, 
is appropriate based on property tax, sales tax, income and earning tax, which are really the three main revenue sources, if you think about it from, from the city's perspective. But I know I think it's important for this committee to note that on the HUD's committee, uh, Chairman Rohde and myself and others are also looking at other performance measures um, on a project by project basis and how it ties into that to that larger uh, narrative of are our incentives working. So looking overlaying public schools, uh, the population increase in an area from the time that it got an incentive seven or eight years ago to now, has that increased and moved the needle or why? And that's telling us, I think that data, affordable housing, has affordable housing gained in demand um, uh, as a result of incentives being used? So I think that's also going to be meaningful data that um, maybe is, is a la carte to this to this uh, model, but I think is is worthy information that we'll have to be able to really you know continue to hone in on an appropriate use of our incentives. So I'll just say that, and and then really quickly, just because you invoked three CDC, I would encourage this this committee and other folks to figure out that organization. I've done work with them for the past ten years, um, and in addition to um, being able to transform an area just just um, I think west of their downtown. Um, and, and Cincinnati is a, a very good analog to St. Louis, for sure. Um, but what also helped them was they had tremendous corporate support. Mm -hmm. I think they had some riots in the, in the mid to late 90s. Um, and co let's see, co Kroger, Procter Gamble, Macy's, um, Macy's Federated, GE has an has a overwhelming presence there. They also sort of passed the hat around and started uh, what was 3CDC, and now they've, they've grown into a, a pretty phenomenal organization. Yeah, and I think, um, I think what they did was the, those companies basically created a seed fund for, Correct. like, revolving loans. Yep. And um, the idea was not that those companies would be giving that as a grant. I think they actually get, like, a very small return on that, but it's way below market rate of return, something a bank wouldn't do. Correct. And the reason why they did it was because they knew they needed to bring in the types of talent in order for them to be remain competitive. Yep. So, um, so it's a, like I said, I love the model that they created out there, and I totally think that SLDC should become like them, but that's just me. <laughs> Great. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. What's that? The U.S. Bank should be one of those <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, so I, I do have a few questions myself, Jonathan. Um, the comparisons that you had uh, with regard to big box retail versus uh, mixed use, uh, how does that play out? You know, in particular in the south and north portions of our city, we have very large tracts of uh, what used to be manufacturing you know, light industrial facilities. You know, obviously they're, you know, taxed at a commercial rate, which is a higher rate than residential. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, most of them are vacant, so we're not collecting any other types of taxes aside from the, the real estate taxes that are there. Um, so how does that, how would that play in? Like, let's say a big box wants to go into, you know, that light industrial corridor area, right? Mm -hmm. Usually there's going to be the layers of, you know, the brown fields, all that kind of stuff, the layers of, you know, tax credits that come along with that. But from a, a TIF or tax abatement perspective, you know, when you have a big box retailer where, you know, the incentive per year you know, might be higher than what it would be normally for a manufacturing. Obviously, you know, it's going to be much more difficult to get a high producing manufacturing facility opened anywhere in the country, you know. So how does something like that play out in this model? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So, um, and actually there was uh, some, so it's, so the, the answer to the question is, um, for starters, that example, again, is looking at the, if you just took all costs and compared all, looked at all properties alike. Um, in reality, areas that are lower density and maybe have lower uh, like economic um, activity going around them are gonna have a lower bar to hit. And so a project like that, you know, probably could uh, succeed in that area. But the other thing that we look at, uh, since you mentioned manufacturing, is we look at the, that's where the land use plan actually comes into the model, into the, the scorecard, 
is we look at um, what is the, uh, again, it's what is the potential for revenue in this area. And we, to determine that, we look at what the historic use has been. So if it's been manufacturing, we, we look at sort of, we set a target as if it was a manufacturing project. If retail comes in and it performs at a level significantly above manufacturing in terms of tax revenue, then it can actually do well in those types of areas. Um, and we actually, I had a, there was a little bit of uh, uh, discussion between me and, um, and the budget director on the city foundry project because that was a manufacturing area um, in the, on the land use plan. Um, and it held that project to a relatively low bar, I would say. And uh, I was, you know, basically we made tweaks to the model for that project because it was one of those things where we were like, should we really be holding this project to such a low bar? Because it's in the central corridor, but it was manufacturing. That's actually why I'm building a version two of the model, partly, um, to, t to take care of problems like that. But, um, and that model, that version is, you know, it's probably along the same timeline as that table that Alderman Ogilvie was talking about, but. Well, and I, I'm, I'm glad that you're working on a, a second version of the model uh, and specifically along those lines. I, you know, my ward, probably about a third of it is light industrial. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, my ward looks like it's a fairly average size ward for the south side, geographically speaking, mm -hmm. but almost all of my population is condensed into about two thirds of it because the other third is all light industrial space. Gotcha. And I think that that's pretty common actually on a lot of wards, particularly in North and South St. Louis. Um, especially the east side of the city. Um, you know, you have the railroad tracks that run along mm -hmm. the riverfront and then also, you know, right down the middle of the city. Uh, you know, the Missouri Pacific Railroad kind of along Gustine on the south side, um, Union to a certain extent on the north side. Um, so, which are, I believe they're all in an enhanced enterprise zone too, if I'm not mistaken. So maybe overlaying the enhanced enterprise zone with uh, you know, this program or the model that you're working on might be helpful. Uh, just, Dale, if I'm not mistaken, almost all of the are, light I mean, industrial. Where the enterprise that's what I thought. So, you know, I don't know if you're considering that in, in the use of your model, but, you know, certainly. Yeah, the yeah and I mean, I guess, um, uh, if you could go back to that ABC project, if you go to the uh, very first tab. Actually, go to the, um, go to the, uh, it's one of the dark green tabs. It says EFIS report to. Is this in the presentation or the model? This is in the model. Okay. This is an actual project, like this is a project example. Okay, so this is a project that um, it's, uh, it's actually, it is a city foundry project, I believe. Um, but uh, what we did was, if you look at, and again, the, um, well, um, can you scroll down just a tiny bit? Yeah. Can you be two places? <laughs> can you maybe blow that up to 110%? My eyes are struggling, and I'm the youngest member on the committee. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not. Well, maybe. It might be shown. Uh, no. <laughs> Scroll to the left and to the down, down and to the left a little bit. Okay, so I want to give an example here. So this project, um, again, it's got the the fractions on it still, but. This project scored three and 3.75 stars out of five. So the, the passing line is three and a half. So it was barely sort of above the threshold, despite the fact that if you look at the 30 year rate of return, um, it's going to generate, which is the box above it, it's going to generate almost $30 million over 30 years compared to uh, um, the opportunity cost of almost 21 million and the average commercial cost of seven. So that's a, uh, compared to the average cost, that's a 320% return on investment to the city. It's 43% um, uh, based on the, uh, the, the model opportunity costs. Now what I'm gonna show you is 
what happens if you take the exact same project and assume that it was, I'm even going to leave it in the same geographical location, but I'm going to assume that it's a, a, an industrial piece of property rather than, uh, rather than special mixed use. So if, uh, Terrence, if you go to the very first tab, we're going to go to the t first tab and we're going to make a change and then we're going to come back to this one. Okay, scroll towards the top, probably. Okay, you see where it says SMUA under on line 14? Click on that box where it says SMUA. There should be a drop down, and change it to BIPA. That's um, industrial, industrial preservation area. Now we're going to go back and take a look at that um, page we were just looking at. Okay, so now it's saying it's a four and a half star project out of five, and what you see is the difference is that before it was saying that that piece of property needed to generate $21 million in order to be sustainable to the city. Now it's saying that piece of property needs to generate $1.6 million to be sustainable to the city. So what I'm doing there is, I, if it's an industrial piece of property, I'm holding it at a much lower bar than I am if it's something that is special mixed use. So it's already doing that to a degree, but what, where I'm trying to fix it is, is if it's industrial, but it shouldn't be considered industrial, for example, near Cortex, right? Because that's probably the only example in the city where it's industrial, but probably shouldn't be considered industrial. So I'm coming up with other metrics. But are you using the land use as to determine? Currently, I'm using the land use plan. Because, I mean, the land use isn't necessarily the most accurate. Or That's correct. It's not. It's not the most accurate. But unfortunately, from the data I had to work with, that's all I had for the first go around. Oh, I feel like the enhanced enterprise zone would be a more appropriate tool for that versus the land use, just okay. because. Uh, Pretty much everything along that enhanced enterprise zone is, you know, like okay. industrial manufacturing. Um, well, it, it, it is. It had to be in order to qualify for it, correct, Dale? So, uh, I'll have to check with the assessor's office and see if they've got, because um, everything is based off of a gigantic spreadsheet of every parcel in the city that comes from the assessor's office. So, I don't think they have a variable for each parcel that says whether or not it's in the enhanced enterprise zone in that spreadsheet, but if it does, I can easily include that in the, mark, in the model. It's it, just a matter of having the data. Uh, it might, uh, but I, uh, part of me wants to say that it does, but I'm not for certain okay. about that, so I, 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 can't, I can't tell you certainly check, one way I'll or another. I'll have to check with them, but yeah, basically, I, everything is built on the data that I have available. So what if the, the second version of the model, the reason why it's different is in the first version, I did not have access to um, information that said how, like what the square footage of buildings were on every parcel. I now have the square footage and the footprint of every building in the city that's going into the model. Um, so. so, and with the substitution effect that you have in place, what, is there a, a square mileage that that's like, so if Walmart were to come into the city, mm -hmm. you know, uh, where are you, where's the substitution coming from? Just the immediate few blocks or a mile or three <laughs> miles, you know, what? For the model's purposes, the city. yeah, for the, mo for the model's purposes is if it doesn't matter what part of the city it is, if, if this, those tax dollars would have been Spent by anywhere else in the city, it's substitution for the city's purposes. So I guess I'm where I get concerned about that is, you know, for instance, I had a, a company that wanted to do some development and a big box development uh, in the 25th, um, part of the 14th at one point, but. Uh, you know that development actually ended up getting built in Shrewsbury and so. How how is that substitution effect? You know, if Walmart comes in and wants to build in the 14th or 22nd ward, mm -hmm. you know, and you know we say, you know, well we'll give you X amount of you know tax incentive based off of this model, based off of a substitution effect of where it's going to be pulling 
retail out of the city, mm-hmm. you know, but then they go right on the city's border to Wellston or Shrewsbury and open up and that substitution effect is happening anyway, but we're not reaping any benefit from it at right. all. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> so I'll, if a project, for example, um, so again, the retail in particular is one of those ones where um, the substitution effect uh, has quite a bit of variability to it. Um, and that's primarily because we don't have a lot of retail in a city. Um, I mean, there are certain types of retail where we don't have anything of, and so there's like virtually no substitution effect on it. Um, and then also what we do is we look at where the people are actually likely to be coming from. Um, if it's the type of thing where the people are going to come from everywhere in the city to go there, then we would look at, you know, obviously what is the citywide substitution effect. Technically, for the, for the purpose of figuring out what the, be, what the effect to the city's budget is, we have to calculate any dollars that would have been captured anywhere in the city otherwise. But in reality, 90 plus percent for most retail is going to be in the area, like if it's, especially if it's neighborhood retail, it's just going to be in that neighborhood where you're going to see it, right? Um, the other thing is, um, uh, projects that, like, I've had projects, uh, I think Alderman Ogilvie's was an example, the, um, the uh, grocery that was going to go in Dogtown, or is going in Dogtown. Um, because it was on the edge, we looked at the competition for the groceries, and I think only one out of three of the competitors were in the city. So that had, whatever the substitution was outside the city, obviously, we didn't count that. Like, that's not substitution for us. It is for the county. It's not for us, so they're not going to count it, so we're not going to count it. Right? Well, I, I mean, I, we, I feel like as a region we're cannibalizing ourselves anyway, but... We are. You know, uh, yeah. We need to fix those issues before you know, we give up the opportunity to develop in the city. So Exactly. Um, most of these tools were designed specifically to help you know, areas such as the city and to have areas like Clayton taking advantage of it is uh, despicable, frankly. But yep. um, so I guess at this point, if we want to get into the actual logic model and walk through the spreadsheet and how calculations yeah. are done, and then we can take questions after that. Are you guys more interested in seeing an actual project example, or are you more interested in seeing the, um, like, how I come up with the revenue per square foot per part of the city? My, well, my questions uh, more so revolved around the zones and how the zones were okay. determined. Um, but are there other, Kara, you had a lot of questions. Oh, I'm sorry, Alderwoman Spencer, you had a lot of questions last week in regards to the model. So is there something in particular that you want him to focus on during his presentation? On the presentation of the model? Mm-hmm. Well, he wants to know if he should just go through a specific project and what that looks like in the model or to walk through how calculations are done in the model. What's your preference? There's the two, there's an actual like project where, I, where we calculate a score um, or there's the, um, the model that tells me what a given piece of property, how much revenue we should expect from it. So there's two different models to go through. Which one are you more interested in seeing? Well, I suppose there's interest on my side in seeing both, but um, what we could do, since I, I, I guess don't know first. That my interest in modeling uh, is universal to the committee, um, you know, we could go through them very generally, and then I can maybe ask Jonathan questions if I, or, I mean, I hate to take up the whole committee's time with, you know, going through. I mean, I think we're all interested in it, but you specifically had some, yeah. I'll I'll ask my anal retentive along. You don't, you're, feel free to ask your question. I think your questions are of benefit to the whole committee, so. Uh, but before Whoa, we do that. dive into this, Jonathan, just because this was a, it was brought up at the last meeting, is someone just like dead set on these stars? No, I mean, I, it was. <laughs> yeah, I, it was honestly, I started with a grade A, B, C, D, F, and then people didn't like that. And so then I moved to, 
I had actually originally it was just a number. It was uh, it was that 36.39 and uh, out of 40, and everyone was like, "What does that mean?" I don't know what that means. So then I went to the A B C D F, and then perhaps just a percentage, you know, 38.9. Yeah, like I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to change it to like it'll say 4.5 out of five. Yeah, or Perfect. or a percent. Yeah. yeah, right. Like you know, how many points? Yeah. yeah. Right. I personally like stars. Okay, that being, I, I'm glad we're all in agreement that stars are out. The, uh, are out. Okay, all right. cool. Let's move, let's well, move on. That's, that's good. Situation. I don't have to figure out how to do Visual Basic to fix the star problem. Okay, um, let's just start at the beginning of this. Um, so this is an actual project example. Um, This is my template. Anytime uh, a project comes and they submit their information and their application, uh, I'll build this this model using this template, or I'll build a model using this template. So, the first two first two tabs here are just the inputs, so the project specific inputs. Um, so you've got your project name, when the year, uh, project's going to be finished with construction, and what month, what year is the first full year of operation, the total square footage of land. I'm not going to go through all these variables because there's like 600 of them. Um, well, that's not true. It's like 400 of them. But um, total square footage of land, total building area, and, um, and so on and so forth. So we have the, in the next set of variables, we've, those are basically the, um, your, the parameters that tell me what to compare it to. So it's in the Midtown neighborhood, 63108 zip code. Um, those are the variables that tell, you know, again, that are based on what the, what the model's gonna say, how much revenue per square foot we need to have. Uh, the land use category, the MVA category, whether or not the property was vacant beforehand, meaning a building or no building, and then whether or not the property um, is on the historic registry. And then I have the base year, um, base your uh, market values, uh, assessed value and market value of the property um, before the project was built. We go into the financing information, so what the loan amount is, what the cost of equity is, and then we start entering in the, um, like what the projected sales taxes are going to be. And so um, what, what I do here is I look at the information that they provide and then I compare it to a very simple um, uh, estimation uh, model, I guess, calculation, if you will, or formula, <clears throat> and that you can't really read it, but it's the sales check is you take gross sales, it should not exceed um, the total annual rent plus CAM divided by 10%. So, um, and the reason for that is because uh, most, most projects are, well, nationally, um, retailers are advised not to, uh, they won't be v able to pay their bills if their rent exceeds 10% of, of their um, sales, right? So if a developer tells me that uh, they're gonna have, you know, sales that's, you know, doesn't line up with that, right? Like they say they're gonna have rents of X, but they say they're gonna have sales of, you know, Y or whatever. Then I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna say either you're way undercharging your rents, right? So if like they're saying, oh, I'm gonna have 50 million dollars a year in sales, but then that's only like two percent or something of their, uh, of what the rents are, then they're either they're way over projecting their sales, which is they're overestimating what the benefit is to the city, or they're um, they're underestimating their rents, which means they're possibly. Uh, uh, not going to pass the but for test. So is that? Does everyone follow? Okay. Um, so anyway, so I've got the sales tax estimates there. Um, I've got the breakdown of what percentage is from restaurant, what percentage from grocery, and what percentage is from other retail. And the purpose for that is for estimating what the um, substitution effect rate is going to be. So different substitution. Uh, percentage used for each of those types uh, of retail. Um, then there's hotel room sales taxes. There's none on this project. Um, then restaurant gross receipts, uh, employee payroll, uh, and utility costs. So those are just estimates of what the economic activity is going to be. Again, I compare everything to 
Um, uh, I look at how many employees they're expected to have per square foot. So usually for office projects, you're gonna have one employee for every 250 square feet at the maximum, and then I compare how many employees they expect they're gonna have, discount for the um, percent vacancy, and then I have to compare um, that to the, uh, the average wage for the type of, if it's office, I look at what the average office you know, worker makes in the St. Louis area. Um, to see if they're overestimating what the payroll is going to be or if it seems to be on track. Um, so again, that's not actually part of the um, what you see here. It's just the checks that I do whenever I'm looking at the, uh, the information that the developer provides. Um, there's no parking tax. Uh, there was no personal property investment, but that's what those big blank boxes are for right there. Uh, to estimate the personal property tax. Um, and then number of full-time jobs is, is uh, and that the very bottom box is there. And then we get into the incentive amount requested. So anyway, these are all the inputs. Um, we go through here. This is the rents that they anticipate on an annual basis. So um, in this case, they were looking at $2 a square foot for the... Um, uh, a month, $24 a year. Um, so that's one thing. Generally, um, residential is quoted as a dollar per square foot per month, and commercial is generated, quoted as a dollar per square foot per year. But anyway, um, $24 and $30. Again, I compare that to the market rents to see if they're under or over um, estimating. You know, if they're underestimating it, then again, that's going to affect their cost benefit, uh, or not cost benefit, it's going to affect their um, uh, but for test. Um, so I want to make sure that they're using market data. Uh, and I look at their operating cost per square foot. Again, I look at, I compare that to market data and, um, and so on. And then below that is their vacancy rates per year. They expect to stabilize at um, an average of uh, almost 5%. So that's, you know, that's actually a little bit conservative. So they're not... Um, you know, not underestimating there. And then I've got the annual growth rates, 2%, which is basically inflation, both expenses and, and revenues grow at that rate. So um, that seems to be reasonable. And again, everything in these cases, you just kind of have to, for growth rates, you just have to say, okay, what is what makes sense on a historical basis? Um, when you're talking 2%, that includes your inflation. So if prices increase by 2% just from inflation, then that's your 2%. That's not actual growth, you know? So, and I, I take the present value on everything on the back end. So I actually use a present value greater than 2%. So I'm actually, um, in some sense, um, making it slightly harder for, for the project that way. Um, okay, so again, office rents, same thing. And then we just got the different types of rents, parking revenues, and so on and so forth. So let's go to the next tab. This is just their sources and uses as they report it to me. Um, and then on the right, I have the cost per square foot of building area. And I take those costs and I compare them to every other project that I've done. So I've got it in a spreadsheet. Um, and I can say whether or not their, their costs of construction are way above um, the norm. Uh, and if that's the case, I'll go back to them and I'll say, why are your costs so high? Um, should we be incentivizing something if it's just because it's being built inefficiently or at a, a high level? You know, if they're building, if they're gold plating everything, are we going to incentivize it just because of that? You know, no, we're not. So, um, so we compare it to what is typical for construction costs. Um, so anyway, so we'll go to the next one because that's, that's pretty much all that tab has. This, <clears throat> this is a cash flow um, projection for the developer, and there's a lot of stuff that feeds in from the next several tabs into this one. So we're going to kind of hit this one, and then we'll kind of briefly touch the next one. So um, Essentially, if you've seen a cash flow statement, it's just your revenues minus your vacancy minus your expenses um, to get to your net operating income. 
and then um, your, uh, you compare that net operating income to your investment to get your rate of return. And then uh, we put in a, a hypothetical um, sale of the property at the end of year 10 to calculate what the rate of return is uh, with and without incentive um, for a 10 year period. So that's basically what all this is. Um, it's fairly straightforward that all gets, this all gets pre-populated uh, or it gets automatically populated based on the variables put in on the first slide. In fact, everything from this point forward comes from the variables on the first two tabs that we talked about and from um, some back-end variables that are um, basically set for every project, but basically tax rates and stuff. So, um, so that's, that's basically what that comes to. And then this, uh, the, um, can you scroll it down just a little bit so we can get the full, that 10 year project rate of return box in there. So this is their rate of return without incentives. So we've got the initial investment amount. Um, you've got the, uh, in that column D there. Yep, in column D, you've got your initial investment amount, you've got your annual cash flow in, and then you've got your sale value at the end of, um, of year 10. Uh, in this case, it's about $61 million is sale value. And you'll notice here that the cost is significantly higher than the sale value, and that's, um, that's usually why we have to have incentives in these cases. The, the sale value is based on market cap, uh, market cap rates and, and the net operating income, which is based off of market rent and, and operating expenses. So anyway, so you can see their rate of return is, is fairly low at 2.8. Um, the next tab is the exact same thing as this one. It's just with the incentives added in. So at the top, we've got extra lines there that show the, if there's a, a SID and a, or a TDD, what the payments are annually from that. Uh, if there's a TIF, what the revenue is from that. Um, TIF and, and SIDs can be done in two different ways. They can be either done pay as you go or they can be done where they're um, monetized up front. So in this case, they were done as pay as you go. So they show up as, um, as revenue every year. If it was um, monetized, then what we would do is we would um, calculate the, the value and subtract that from the project cost. Um, and so we'd have a lower initial project cost, so it ends up being basically the same, same net effect to the rate of return. Um, so in this case, it's 6.3%, and you can also see that the sale value increases from 60 million to 80 million because of the incentive. Um, what's that? Um, can, do you need that blown up? But I feel like I'm boring you guys. I think I'm boring myself. Um, okay, so the real estate tax tab is next. Again, this is just estimating what the property taxes are gonna be. It's all based on the market values. The market values are all based on, on a formula given to us basically by the assessor's office. So we look at what the net operating income is um, by the type. We look at a, um, in fact, I'm gonna take you to the tab. This is where it kinda, I hate jumping around, but probably need to in this case. Um, so go towards the far right. There's a tab called the uh, Assessor's Office Data. So these are the, um, the cap rates and the vacancy rates that are used um, for each type of property. So you've got industrial and apartments and office and so on. And so uh, those all go into the formula to figure out what the, uh, what the tax uh, market value is of the property, and then it's simply, uh, if it's commercial, it's 32% of the market value is the assessed value multiplied by the property tax gives you the tax per year. Um, so we can go back to the, the tab after real estate tax now. A lot of this other stuff I'm going to breeze through. Um, this is calculating the personal property tax. There was none on this project, so we'll, we'll skip this one. TIF revenues, so in this case there was a TIF. Um, so we're looking at what the, again, the property tax is, and then we're pulling information from that first tab to figure out how much um, 
how much each of those taxes are, so how much payroll tax is going to be generated, earnings tax, uh, yeah, payroll and earnings tax, sales tax, and so on, how much of that is subject to TIF capture, and then um, how much that uh, translates into in terms of uh, uh, revenue that can be captured by the TIF. So what we do is we take uh, the economic activity taxes and we divide it by 1.25 to S for a 1.25 debt coverage ratio and we divide the pilots by 1.1. Um, can you scroll to the left a little bit? All the way to the left is where we do the pilot calculation. So that's divided by 1.1. Um, so we're basically saying that that portion of the revenue that's gonna be generated by the TIF is not available for capture by the TIF. And then further, we're discounting it by a discount rate um, of, in this case, I think it's 6.5%. So um, if you scroll all the way to the right again. So the, um, you can blow that up so we can see it. Yeah, just right there. Uh, all the way to where it says the, uh, the 19.7 million, one row below that. What I need is the basically rows 47 through 49. Hey, Jonathan, do you mind if we pause and just take any questions that folks might have up until this point? Sure. Okay. I, Alderwoman Spencer, I know that you indicated that you have some questions. Do you, do you have any that you want to ask at this point? Um, I, I don't really have any specific questions other than um, I know that the model is quite substantial in size. And um, if possible, if there's a generalized uh, model to share, it's hard, it's hard to go through. And if, if this is not feasible, um, certainly uh, understand, especially given its size, but uh, that would be my question, whether or not we could tangibly. Well, so I know at last week's meeting we had talked about maybe getting a, a, zip, drive. a zip drive that has a you know, blank version of the model or, uh, well. Yeah, maybe, so this example. Blank because I know it'll. Yeah, uh, this like this example model. right here was emailed to, I sent it to Gerard and he, I think he. In the email? I forwarded an yeah. email out this morning, earlier yep. this morning. That's, so this model is in that. Okay, all right, so we all have a copy of that in our inbox then. And it's helpful to kind of go through this in a general sense and if you don't mind, I might follow up with a couple email questions, uh, but as of right now, I appreciate you being willing to kind of share share the general flow of it uh, because it is obviously pretty complex. Uh, Alderman Gunther, anything? No. Alderman Oldenburg. Just one quick yes, thank you. Just one quick question: How are you arriving at um, the sale price? The hypothetical sale price? Are you using a cap rate? Yeah. Um, will you go to property sale value? Um, it's three tabs over from the one we're at right now. So again, what I'm doing is I'm taking the stabilized uh, net operating income and I am um, using cap rates from the Real Estate Research Corporation. Got it. Um, and uh, I adjust for the, you know, the, I apply the real estate tax to the portion, you know, I proportionally apply it so that it's, um, I guess I could also just do it at the average rate. But anyway, I proportionally apply it to figure out what the market value of each component of the project is and then sum it all together to, f to get the, the end value. Okay. Got it. That's all I have. I, I have uh, is, is that all you had, Alderman? And then the other thing I do all is if there's, a, if there's an incentive that goes beyond the 10-year period, I figure out what the present value of the remainder of that incentive is. Uh, at year 10, and I add that into the value too. Okay. So that's why there was a difference uh, between the incentivized and non incentivized sale value. The sale value itself was the same, but there was additional present value of, of incentive left to be paid after year 10 that was included. I follow. Okay. 
Miss, Mr. Chairman, as a matter of clarification, what is a cap rate? Can you just the, yeah, a cap rate is a um, is a a measure of um, uh, basically it says what percentage. Um, how do I explain this? The way it's calculated is you take the net operating income and you divide it by the sale price, right? Um, so essentially, what that means is that a uh, if a project has a uh, a lower cap rate. That means that um, people are willing to pay more for that piece of property. If it has a higher cap rate, people are willing to pay less for that property. Uh, the way to think about it is, if you have a net, net operating income of $100,000 and you have a, uh, a sale value of a million dollars, you've got a 10% cap rate. All that is, is there's, there's market data that says, based on the type of the project, property that is and where it's located, what people on average have been paying for properties like that, right? So the cap rate comes from existing sales. So we look at existing sales of similar properties and we say on average, this type of property is selling at a cap rate of 8%. And so we then take that 8%, apply it to the net operating income of this specific project to figure out what it would sell for in the market. So my question uh, is, these are Excel spreadsheets, obviously. Uh, is all of this manually, and I know there's formulas in there, you know, clearly, but the data, aside from, you know, the specific <laughs> information related to that particular project that we're, you know, talking about at that point in time, mm -hmm. you know, how much of this is, you know, variable data that changes, that needs to be updated? You know, I'm just trying to think if, and maybe Alderman Rohde can chime in here as well, but, Some you know, if we're happen. legislating this either through res resolution or, you know, board bill, you know, either way, you know, if we're legislating this and this is a model that, you know, you're manually updating, you know, if you get hit by the perver proverbial beer truck, you know, who's going to come in and, and continue working with this logic model uh, yeah, um, so Terrence, I guess can my, you... Uh, the first part of the question is, you know, is this manual or automated? It's automated, um, the, but there are obviously inputs that have to be updated. Can you go to the right to the light purple tabs? Okay, so the light purple tabs are the ones that um, are the data that comes in from the back end that have to be uh, updated and adjusted. Um, so we saw the office, assessor's office data comes straight from the assessor's office. They give me information sort of on an annual basis, basically. Um, and I just update this table with the information they give. The next tab is the real estate research cap and yield rates. That's updated on a quarterly basis. Um, actually, I need to change the title. I changed the numbers without changing the title on this one. That's the uh, second quarter of 2017 is the most recent information we're on right now. So um, you won't be able to change it. I've got it all password protected. Huh? Who knows your passwords, Jonathan? Huh? Who knows the password? Currently, just me. Yeah. Okay. So the beer trucks. <laughs> beer, beer trucks. Truck. Exactly. Um, well, I, so I guess uh, what might be helpful for the committee, um, you know, where the data comes. So maybe if there's a way you know, outside of this presentation. I know you emailed us this, but, you know, if there's a document or an email that you could just elaborate, you know, where the data is collected for each one of the tabs, you know, that that's out there that does, that's not a formulaic tab. Yeah. Does that make sense? So, uh, yeah. like, where's the data source coming from? You know, for me, it would be helpful to understand, you know, on each tab that, is storing data to feed into the formulas. Where are we gathering that? You know, what is it? Where is it coming from? Kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, you know, but also, you know, I do have concerns around legislating something, and you know, basically, you're the only person that has the keys to the kingdom. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, if you get a six-figure job somewhere outside of SLDC, or you know, decide to retire based off of you know where you're at right now, you know, whatever happens. Uh, you know, the city right. unfortunately doesn't have a lot of bench strength 
sitting anywhere in any department at this point in time. Um, so, you know, I, I get a little concerned about that. Yeah, I, um, and I've uh, said this before, I've told Otis this too, I think that all this can be um, turned into an online model that can be uh, probably outsourced, so that doesn't even have to be, we can, uh, once it's turned into an online model, I think it can be easily outsourced into a way that's, you don't even have to rely on internal um, capacity to do it anymore. So just as an FYI, as you're an employee of the city or SLDC, any you know, con you know construct that you come up with is proprietary information of the city. So don't think that you're going to go privatize this and outsource it. And right. No. Lease it back to you. <laughs> no. No. I understand that. It would have to be updated. So you'd have to pay somebody to update it. But um, but yeah, I think that. Um, uh, well, I will say there have been, we actually have been contacted by other cities that actually want this thing replicated if we, to, if we want to lease it to other cities, that's great. Just don't think that you're going to start your own private company uh, and lease this back to us kind of a thing. No, no, absolutely not. Uh, anyway, that's beside the point. But um, so for me, I think it would be helpful wherever the data sources are coming from, you know, just elaborating on that. Um, and you know, I do have concerns around the assessor's office and the reliability of data that that comes, I mean, data is only as good as the data that you put into the system, obviously. And right. um, I mean, just in my short tenure down here at the board, I've run across a number of situations on residential and commercial properties where they haven't necessarily been assessed accurately. So, and just in my short, you know, few months as chair of this committee, you know, it's become even more, you know, obvious that right. that's an issue from time to time. No offense to the assessor's office because I know that they're also short-staffed and overworked as well. Yeah, so I, uh, the main information that comes in for this from the assessor's office is really just that formula that figures out how to take you know, project-specific information and calculate what the market value is. Um, although it does play more into when we get into what the um, you know what how much revenue we expect from a given piece of property but um, I think in that case you kind of get to the law of averages which kind of weeds out a lot of the errors um, so anyway uh, we'll go to the back end variables so the first two basically one is assessor's office data the second is a, a, a quarterly report that we pay for it's like 300 bucks a year or something to get that market data so it's easily accessible um, the back-end variables, these are things that um, are mostly just like tax rates, so they only change whenever the tax rates change, essentially. But, um, you know, we've got the set debt coverage ratio, set loan-to-value ratio. Those are sort of like standard for the industry. They're not really going to change probably hardly ever. Um, you know, how much we allow for the developer fee for... Um, so... Uh, in the calculation, when I calculate their rate of return, I take their developer fee into ca account too. On average, a project um, will uh, be between three and five percent of the project cost. Uh, three and five percent of that will be developer overhead. That's actual cost incurred. Anything above that is basically deferred you know, revenue to the, pro to the developer. So we take anything above that percentage and we count that as, as um, basically as profit. So when calculating the rate of return. So that's just what we say if, if the developer fee is above 3.5% of, um, of development cost and 1% of acquisition cost, anything above that number is considered profit to the project. Um, we've got the reinvestment rate that's for calculating the modified internal rate of return. That's just saying what is the uh, invest, what is the rate of return that this developer could get with their cash if they put it somewhere else besides this project. And that's basically uh, a long-term average rate of return from the stock market, more or less. That's pretty much not going to change unless you listen to some analysts. But... Um, then you've got the, uh, again, the assessment and tax rates. Those change whenever there's, uh, you know, a referendum or whatever, and the tax rates change, so that gets, just gets updated annually. Those rates just are whatever they are. 
Um, then there's the TIF tax rates. So the tax rates are not fully captured by the TIF. So for example, the, um, uh, the only portion of the sales tax that's captured by the TIF is the 3.1% that goes to the city, um, the different city funds, and then also to, um, I think it's uh, Metro Parks and Recreation maybe. But um, so 3.1% out of the full tax rate of like 8.4 or whatever gets captured by the TIF. So those are things that are all sort of um, ingrained within um, sort of state statute. So if those were to ever change, we would update them, but they basically don't change um, for the most part. Um, again, we've got uh, TIF capture percentages. Uh, def on, by default, a TIF will capture 100% of the pilots and 50% of the economic activity taxes. The reason with this is in here is um, so that I can adjust it. So um, if we want to, we can customize a TIF project and we could say, hey, look, um, we're going to give you a TIF, but you're bringing in, I don't know, a retailer that's from a different part of the city or you're bringing in something that we think has, you know, a too high of a substitution rate on it, so we're going to not let you capture any of the sales tax, right, or only 25% of it or whatever. So it's just so that it can be modified for the project. Um, then you've got the if city. May, John, so with, with these models and the continuing work that's happening around CBAs, how, how would that factor into the model in terms of, like, once we establish some sort of CBA for the city? Uh, is that, again, something that you would have to go back and manually enter into this, or, I mean? Um, I mean, I guess it depends. Are you talking about a CBA that would like be... a community uh, benefit agreement where... Yeah, you know, I'm they, just trying to think how it would know, affect... You know, payment in lieu of taxes, you know, uh -huh. I mean... I don't know what it's going to look like yet. I mean, there's like three different variations of it floating out there at the moment. Uh, but, you know, would you be able to accommodate any of those three in your model? I'm assuming so, but, you know, you have to ask the question. Yeah, probably what I would do is, um, I mean, in terms of city financial benefit, um, unless it's something that's going to be flowing directly to the general fund, it wouldn't. As far as the model's concerned, it, it doesn't count unless it's, you know, city revenue dollars. So the so, model is only pertaining to city dollars, but in this committee specifically, when we're dealing with tax abatements, and I, the model, so the model only It does school to, district too, but... But does the model, the model is only for projects of a million dollars or more, correct? Right. So, uh, on a, so we wouldn't even apply the model to any kind of, res I mean, most residential, you know, particularly single family, it's not ever going to apply. But, you know, down in Southeast City where we have, you know, larger multifamily, you know, units, especially when you're getting into historic preservation tax credits and things of that nature, I mean, it can very easily reach a million dollars with a scattered site redevelopment plan. Uh, would a scattered site go through this as well? Or, you know, I'm just thinking like Lutheran Housing Development Group is doing a scattered site in the 20th Ward and parts of the 9th and 25th. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, would that be something that's subjected to the model? Or is that I mean, it could be. Uh, the model could do that. Um, it would just be a matter of, you know, we would just, I mean, you could either, um, like I use the model to do the, although it's, not exactly scattered site, but the um, Preservation Square project, which is McCormick Barron, which is a large area being done in like seven phases. Um, I treated each phase as a separate project essentially, and then sort of like summed them up at the end to a net net impact. Um, but for a scattered site project, I mean, it could be done just by just basically taking each parcel and, and aggregating it together. Yeah, so that, that's all done in the first tab. It's just how you enter the variables on the first, you know, in the first, um, on the variables tab here. Um, and yeah, similar, you know, to your question of the cost benefit agreements, uh, or cost, what am I getting confused? Uh, the community benefit agreements. 
with that, again, if it's, it's probably not going to directly impact the city's, uh, you know, financial cost benefit. Obviously, it's a, a tangential or intangible, rather, um, benefit to the city uh, from a financial standpoint, maybe. But it is a cost on the developer's bottom line. So what we do is we just include that in their costs. We build it within their operating expenses is what we would do. Or if it's an upfront thing that they're paying, we would just add that to the project cost. It's pretty simple to do. Um, also, uh, I wasn't planning on this meeting going past 1230. I don't know how many of you were either, but um, you know, we're at about 1215 right now, and I don't know how much more of a presentation you have to give or if there's anything. I mean, I could, uh, really, the rest of this stuff is just um, sub-calculations that go into the uh, calculating the rate of return and the um, probably the most important if we go to the left a little bit we'll just go straight to the city's return well and i don't know if i missed it but where is the mva as part of this uh, yeah that's in the score um the scorecard sheet so maybe can we just go over the scorecard sheet again real quick yeah Minus the stars. Can you, um, let me see something. Can you click on the, um, there. You're fine. I'm listening. Um, so this formula looks way more complicated than it actually is. Um, if you, uh, if you double click on that box, that's the formula for each piece. Um, basically what this does, I can't even see it that close. Um, basically what the model, what this formula does is it says, um, it, it first, again, it looks more complicated than it is. It's just, first it's saying, um, and if you scroll down a little bit, Terrence, there's a box at the bottom that says MVA category. Okay. So <clears throat> the two th sort of, um, variables that I use to adjust the target level is I use the MVA category and I use whether or not it's uh, on the historic registry. Um, more or less what, what it does is it says if, um, if let's say the sustainable value of revenue that the city needs to get from a piece of property is $100,000. If the project generates that $100,000 on the on the mark, then it hits a it's a 75% score, right? 75% is basically passing. If you hit the mark, you're passing. If you're above 75%, then obviously you get you know a, a higher a higher score or whatever. Um, and 75% would you know would be basically or yeah it would be three and a half stars um, out of five. So what the, uh, what the MVA does is it says um, the target is 75% for, you know, basically for MVA A. If it's an MVA B, C, D, it basically gets slightly lower. It's like essentially instead of having to hit exactly on the number, you have to hit maybe 5% below that for MVA B, 10% below that for MVA C, and it just gets down the line. That's essentially how it works. Um, and that's, if you go into the formula and you go work through it, that's essentially what it's doing. Um, what it's saying there is, um,
Yeah, so it's, it's just saying, um, basically, like I said, it's just saying this, the scoring requirements are you have to hit X amount of revenue. So you can see that in the, uh, if you scroll up a little bit, you can see the targets here for this piece of property. Um, the sustainable target is, uh, and <clears throat> we adjusted it to the industrial, so it's lower than what the actual what it was for the actual project, but you can see the sustainable target is 350,000 or whatever that says, 351. Um, so what it's saying is that that's an, an uh, that's a, I think that's what we need over a 10 year period. So, um, so over 10 years, we need to generate 350,000. The actual project is going to generate, uh, in this case, 2.7. 2.7 million during the incentive period and 9.5 million uh, sort of like excluding the incentives. Um, so then that gets compared to that 350,000. In this case, um, it's getting the maximum amount. It's, uh, so if you hit the 75%, the if you hit the target, you get 75% of the points possible. Points possible in this case 13 for the value score, that's the, uh, the long-term or after incentive period revenue. And then the revenue score is the, uh, the immediate revenue. So that's how I weight it. So you can see the, it's weighted 13 to 23, it looks like. Um, and then four points is allocated to the increment, which is the immediate revenue available relative to what's there today. Um, Anyway, so again, if it, it's a certain percentage above that target level, then it'll get the next level, of, you know, the score will be that much higher. If it's below that, I don't know. I don't know if it's kind of hard to explain, but does that make any sense at all? Yeah, that's very helpful. Uh, so we're getting close to 1230, Jonathan. Uh, Beth or Carol? Alderwoman Murphy or, no, okay, Alderwoman Spencer, are you, do you have any other questions? Um, not at this time, thank you, Jonathan. Alderman Gunther, no okay, Alderman Murphy, thank you, uh, Alderwoman Howard, oh, I, sorry. I, I wanna just say that I appreciate all the work he's done with this. This mm -hmm. is really a, uh, demystifies or deconstructs this whole process and gives me a better feeling on, on how it's done and a way to explain to my constituents that we're not given the store away. Uh, most of the times that it's, it's a very calculated way of, of determining what people are allowed in these instances. And I think that, um, you know, in the past we've, we've demonized these incentives and, and made them, um, you know, that they're taking away from the neighborhoods. But I think most of the time because we just figure that somebody makes up a figure on what they're going to give. But when I see the work that goes into this, it's not at all, uh, you know, pulling the rabbit out of the hat and, you know, Ballpark Village gets, you know, X amount because it's Ballpark Village and we all love the Cardinals. It's not emotional. It's very calculated. So I, I, I commend you on your work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so to echo, you know, Alderwoman Howard's, uh, you know, sentiments, I just, I think it's been very helpful and I appreciate you spending so much time down here with the Neighborhood Development Committee. I know you've been going through an exhaustive process with the HUDS committee as well, um, let alone all of the, you know, work that you've put into, you know, developing the formulas and the models that, you know, we're starting to use in our deliberative processes here down at the Board of Aldermen and, and at SLDC. Um, so in a, as we continue the conversation around incentive reform, I definitely think you know, this becomes a very central part you know, of that as well. So um, definitely wanna commend you for all of the work that you've put into it over the last several months in particular. Um, and you know, I, I know that we have a, a neighborhood development committee meeting that's scheduled for next Tuesday. I know you're generally in attendance at, at those. Are you planning on being there next Tuesday as well? Uh, yeah, as long as my wife is not given birth yet. I, I, I know that you have some uh, family obligations to, to take care of and certainly understand those as well. Um, 
So, you know, if, if there aren't any other questions of Mr. Ferry, uh, you know, I'm going to go ahead and conclude our, our discussions if, uh, related to the subject for today. And we'll see you all, well, I'll see some of you all tomorrow. But, um, you know, we do have a neighbor development meeting scheduled for next Tuesday at 9 a.m. Uh, Tuesday at 9 a.m. next week, uh, and we have several board bills, uh, uh, several, uh, I do mean several, okay, um, well probably board over board. 20 board bills that will be heard at that committee hearing next week. Um, so I apologize to the alderwoman for the 14th and upsetting her, her plans uh, for next Tuesday, okay. but uh, I will, I'll try and be mindful of that going forward as well. But. Um, Anyways, thank you all for your time today. Thank you, Jonathan, uh, very much uh, for the presentation, uh, your answers to our questions, and just all of the work that you've put into this. Um, again, if anyone has questions, if you could email them to me so that I can you know, funnel them over to SLDC and Jonathan, and then share back with the rest of the committee as well, um, I think that would be helpful and constructive. And also, thank you, Terrence, for your time this morning as well, and your... Uh, ingenuity. I always appreciate that. So um, thanks everyone. See you next Tuesday. I adjourn the Neighborhood Development Committee for today's meeting. Thank you.